In today's hectic world, it's next to impossible to get everything done that you need to, let alone all the stuff that you want to do. It's why I'm out in the greenhouse at midnight, potting up kale plants. It'd be pretty sweet to spend hours and hours consuming long, hopefully informative gardening videos, but honestly, who has the time? Luckily, we got garden quickies to cut out all the fluff. Here's episode 61 to 70. Enjoy. We can all agree that without good soil, our gardens are going nowhere. The seeding, planting, growing, and harvesting, they're all a reflection of the quality of our soil. And because we take care of and amend our soils, they afford us with the unreal bounties that we enjoy every year. But of course, it isn't so simple. Not all soil is the same. Not just in our garden, but also those that are offered for sale at the store. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all the gardening topics. And today's video is all about the different soil types. For the purpose of this video and backyard gardening in general, there's three main types of soil that we deal with. Topsoil, garden soil, and potting soil. Let's look at topsoil first. Topsoil is defined as the silt, clay, and sand removed from the top 12 inches of land. It's the uppermost layer of the earth, and our source of it is overwhelmingly from construction sites, if you can believe it. It's cheap, readily available, and due to its source, the exact composition and even the safety all depends on where it was collected. Next up is garden soil, and it's a type of soil that's amended with organic matter, and it's intended to be used in our gardens. Again, its composition can vary, and if you're not making your own, you're at the mercy of the source. So, at the most basic level, topsoils and garden soils differ in three different ways. The first is composition. Garden soils, as we mentioned, contain a far higher organic component. Next is availability. Quality garden soil can be quite elusive, especially during the peak times of the year when there's high demand. And third is the usage. Generic topsoil tends to be used in lawn care and large landscaping projects, while garden soil is what we're after when we're growing veggies. And our last soil type is the type that these guys are in, and that's potting soil. This guy is a different beast altogether, a highly specific blend of a few different components. At its base, you'll have either garden soil or compost, Mix roughly half and half with either peat, if it's commercial, or coconut fiber, if it's being made by the conscientious home grower. Structural amenities such as perlite and vermiculite can be added, as well as several fertilizing agents if need be. Different soils for different uses, each helping your garden in their own way. Hey, know what else is going to help your garden in its own way? The next episode of The Garden Quickie. There's no doubt about it, plants love the indoor life. Especially all those veggies that we started early indoors over the winter. They respond so well to the moderate stable conditions that even new growers can find early success. But all that seems to change when it's time to take them out into the garden. The plants fail to keep that growing trajectory. Or sometimes, they simply fail completely. What gives? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all aspects of growing a garden. And today is all about transplanting. Or more accurately, transplanting fails. I've singled out three main reasons why our plants fail in the transition from indoors to outside, Time's short as always, so let's dive in. The main reason that plants fail when you first take them outside is that they're not hardened off first. Plants are very adaptable organisms, the most adaptable on the planet. But they get used to sets of conditions very easily. 
indoors with little to no wind, perfect even temperatures, and the soft glow of our grow lights, the plants burst with impressive greenery. But not only is that not sustainable, the plants aren't nearly tough enough to grow outside. Acclimatize your plants gradually to the harsher conditions in your garden, and you'll have infinitely more success. For a full in-depth tutorial on hardening off indoor plants, check out this video here. The second reason for seedlings to fail when moved outdoors is transplant shock. Often directly related to hardening off, transplant shock is much more immediate and much more severe. The act of disturbing the plant, mainly the roots, coupled with a brand new environment, can often result in transplant shock. It varies in severity, and it affects different plants differently, with some being more susceptible than others. Moisture and temperature are the biggies, so make sure that the plants and the new soil is well hydrated, and that the day you plant them on is not extreme weather-wise. And the last reason for a transplant fail is timing. Too early, and it's just not going to work. The plants simply aren't ready. You see, proper transplanting is a function of two different sets of timing. Both the timing of the age of your plants, as well as the timing of your weather and your calendar dates. When it's all said and done, the age of your plants can make up for any inconsistencies in your timing, and thus takes precedence. Know what else takes precedence? Watch in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Leafy crops are special in that they're ready for harvest fast, because we're really only after the leaves. They're also special because you can take from them time and time again. And leading that longevity and productivity charge is kale. Even more so than lettuce and spinach, which tend to call it quits after a couple of months, kale just keeps on going and going. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we answer all the gardening questions. And today's episode is all about kale longevity. Kale is a leafy green in the brassica family of crops. In fact, it's a species that has many cultivars. You've probably heard of some of them, including broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and collard greens. They're all the same species, brassica oleraceae. And within this group of plants, including kale, are specimens known as biennials, plants that take two years to complete their life cycle. In the first year, the plants sprout and grow, and they become these leaf-producing machines, like this dinosaur kale here. And in the second year, after a winter fertilization period, the plants undergo flowering. So depending on when you first seed them, we get a minimum of two years for each kale plant. Even after flowering, however, they kind of keep growing, sometimes for three to four years or more. But never with the same leafy vigor as the first year. Not to mention, even the taste changes. After flowering, or even in the months leading up to it, the leaves turn much more bitter and much more pungent. They're still edible, just not nearly as tasty as year one. So the next batch of kale you grow can definitely grow longer than that initial season. But it does come at a cost. It's not free. You know what is free though? The next episode of The Garden Quickie. Now more than ever, it's important for us to be self-sufficient. Rising costs, rising uncertainty. It's becoming a reality that the more you can do for yourself, the better off you'll be. But to us, it's nothing new. As gardeners, we live and breathe this stuff. Producing amazing food with just our two hands, some dirt, and a little knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we all become a little more self-sufficient. <sighs> and today, we're putting garlic on a pedestal. Growing any crop is being self-sufficient, no question. But some plants are a better choice than others when it comes to food security. 
I'm gonna nominate garlic as one of those choices, and here's five reasons why. One, it's easy to grow, and it's super low maintenance. Virtually pest-free and requiring little space and care, growing garlic frees us up to do and grow other things. Not only is it easy to grow, it grows from itself. Garlic is planted in the fall from the individual cloves contained inside the bulb that you harvested that summer. A true cycle of self-sufficiency. And speaking of planting in the fall, yes, garlic is a long crop, but it spends most of its life cycle growing over winter, freeing up your garden spaces to grow other plants. Our fourth reason to pick garlic to grow for a self-sufficient lifestyle is that it stores well. Just as garlic takes a long time to grow, it also keeps for a long time. Months under normal conditions, and years if frozen or jarred. And that's really efficient, because garlic almost never goes bad. And finally, growing your own garlic is good because of the alternative. The vast majority of garlic in our stores is imported. And let me tell you, it comes from countries with less stringent chemical and pesticide laws than we have. And with that said, there's nothing more self-sufficient than looking after your own health. Except maybe watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Growing your own strawberry plants at home is rewarding and actually quite easy, even for novice gardeners. The plants are fairly undemanding, if not adaptable. The trick with strawberries though, is getting that monumental harvest and also berries that taste their best. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we solve all your gardening questions. And today is all about fertilizing strawberries. What should you feed with and when should you feed? Time's ticking as always, so let's dive in. Despite being really low maintenance, strawberry plants are quite heavy feeders. Which leads us to the first question, what should we feed with? For the best strawberry fertilizers, it's all about balance. Too much in any one macronutrient, your NPK, and you're going to get uneven results. Always aim for a balanced blend and make sure to include trace minerals and elements. It's the compounds of those other things, things other than your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, that's going to give strawberries their extreme flavor. I tend to go with liquid organic seaweed or kelp extracts, dilute to the manufacturer's specs, and it consistently gives me the best results. They've got a balanced NPK, and they're just loaded with trace minerals and elements. Once we know what we're feeding with, we then need to decide when to feed. This one's easy, because strawberries only get fed twice a year. Once in the spring, about two weeks after they break dormancy, and then again in the late summer, early fall, after you've harvested the last berry. The spring feed gives your strawberry plants the boost they need for that epic berry production, and the fall feed restores that vitality to your spent plants that have winter dormancy looming on the horizon. Fertilize the roots, not the leaves, and enjoy your best strawberry harvests yet. Know what else is good to enjoy? The next episode of the Garden Quickie. Ah, uh, garlic. The low maintenance crop that you plant in the fall, forget about it until the following summer, and voila, big ball magic come harvest time. Right? Well, sort of. While it's most certainly low maintenance, especially for how long the crop grows for, getting the biggest harvest is going to require a little extra. A little bit of help from us. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we help all your plants. And today, we're talking about fertilizing garlic. When to fertilize, how much to fertilize, and what to fertilize with. We'll cover it all today. Time is short though, so let's dive in. Garlic lies dormant for so much of its life. In some cases, over half its life cycle to begin with is in this quasi state of dormancy. However, I've dug them up after two months in the ground in the frozen days of December, and the cloves are for sure growing. The second the garlic hits moist soil in the fall, it starts to grow. 
White roots appear within days, and in years that it's warmer, the plants are going to sprout even before winter. Given my mild climate, that actually happens to me every fall and winter. And yet, I still don't fertilize before spring. In that window of time between when you plant and the spring thaw, you should be able to get away without an application of fertilizer. If you're like me, and you consistently build up your soils with organic matter, and you amend with some compost in the fall at the time of planting, your garlic shouldn't need anything from you until the spring. With spring in full swing, as well as your garlic, now is the time for that first round of fertilizer. Right around that last spring frost date, depending on the ups and downs of winter, your garlic should have sprouted. In fact, it could be as tall as six inches or more. Right now is when they need their first dose of nutrients. For garlic, you want to skew higher in nitrogen. That's the first number describing the NPK on any commercial fertilizer. One good liquid feed through that mulch gets the garlic party started. Spring does what spring does. The weather warms up and the rains fall. Both of those things are going to deplete the nutrient levels in an actively growing garlic patch. So one more time, at least six weeks before that mid-summer harvest window, you're going to apply another round of fertilizing. Same as before, just dilute to the manufacturer's specs and water from above. You don't want to feed again any later than this, any closer to that harvest, as that could delay or even stunt the bulb growth. That's it. Two feedings. Once when the garlic wakes up in the spring, and then again four to eight weeks later, depending on your climate. Easy peasy. You know what else is easy peasy? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Kale. For a crop that's so easy to sprout and grow, and to be successful with, getting the most out of its harvest is surprisingly nuanced. By picking the leaves at the right time in the right way, your kale plants will become a long-lasting powerhouse of production. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll show you how to get the most out of all your crops. And this episode is all about harvesting your kale. When to harvest, how to harvest, and how much to harvest. Time short as always, so let's get into it. Kale is great to harvest because the leaves are super hardy and they actually taste better when the cooler weather hits. On top of that, with kale, we're only after the leaves and this makes them infinitely easier to grow than a fruiting crop. Plus, it lends itself to multi-harvesting. In temperate climates, kale is best harvested on either side of summer. That is, during the cooler days of spring and fall. In warmer regions, just try to harvest during your coolest months for the best palatability. To accomplish that though, and achieve that right window of harvest for your area, requires careful timing of the sprouting and planting of kale. For that, and all things growing kale, check out this guide right here. Okay, we know when to harvest, but how can we harvest the kale so that it keeps producing for us? Simple. Always take the lower, outer, older leaves first. That's it. As long as you leave a top whirl of five to seven leaves, the plant's going to keep growing and keep producing. In fact, your plant will be healthier for it. Removing the old leaves stimulates new growth and turns your kale plants into green machines. You'll be surprised at their new vigor. Mature leaves should be harvested at no later than two months of age. They need to be picked before they get older and lose their sweetness. On the flip side, you can also harvest the younger leaves after around three to four weeks as baby greens. At this stage, they have maximum sweetness. Know what else has maximum sweetness? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. When I started my gardening journey years and years ago, it was all about form and function. Not necessarily pure aesthetics, but definitely planned, spaced, and orderly. Everything in its place, and a place for everything. 
As my garden career grew and the time I spent amongst my plants increased, I realized that there was a different way to garden and that the new ways weren't necessarily the better ways. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we talk about all the gardening styles, regardless of the weather. And today's episode is a short exploration into the world of cottage gardens. It's a vast subject with as many intricacies as the gardens themselves. For today though, as time is limited, let's just focus on the definition of what makes a garden a cottage garden. Cottage, or English gardens, are a distinct style of gardening that uses a compact, informal design consisting of a mix of edible, ornamental, and indigenous plants. These gardens tend to nestle themselves right up against a structure, such as a small house or a cottage in the old days, or up against a greenhouse, like I've done with mine. Other features include denser than normal plantings, often at random, as well as overgrown patches, biennials left to flower, and a general state of organized chaos to the casual observer. But as the grower and the caretaker, you gain an intimate knowledge of the space, the soil, and the plants, because they're yours. You know the space like the back of your hand, even though the plants are not rows and rows of monochromatic boredom. Each of your plants is placed with a purpose, and although it's hidden, your soil becomes a massive web of bioactivity. What I found out over the years is that a cottage garden is personal, both in the space itself and in the pleasure it invokes for the caretaker. They're not perfect, but they're perfect for you. And speaking of perfect, it's perfectly okay to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I think it's fairly obvious by now that I love to garden in fabric grow bags. I've replaced nearly every large pot in my garden with a fabric grow bag of similar size, and I'm not going to be going back to hard pots anytime soon. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we show you all the best ways to grow. And today's episode is all about fabric grow bags, or more accurately, the benefits of. I got six in total and time is ticking, so let's get into it. Probably the most readily tangible difference of fabric grow bags versus traditional pots is drainage. Instead of just four or six holes on the bottom, fabric pots can drain excess water in a three-dimensional fashion, fully eliminating root rot and other poor drainage afflictions. And if we dig a little deeper, we find our second benefit, which also affects the roots. Instead of creating a mass of roots that gets bound and wound, and limits the plant's growth, the roots hit the side of the fabric pot and get exposed to air. This prunes the exploring roots, causing them to branch out and creates a much more fibrous, efficient root system. Another positive for grow bags is these little handles that they come with. It makes moving them around a cinch, even the really large ones. The bags themselves are also really lightweight, so moving this 10 gallon garlic bag is a piece of cake. Back to that drainage. It also works in reverse. A great way to water plants grown in these things is to give them a bathroom below. During those really hot weeks of summer, the soil will be able to soak up as much water as it can hold, keeping your plants hydrated and happy. Speaking of those hot summer days, another benefit of these fabric grow bags is that even the black ones don't get scorching hot from that direct summer sun. And finally, one more direct comparison to the traditional plastic pots. The fabric ones last way longer. It's no contest. The sun doesn't readily break them down and they never crack or split. They just last so much longer. Seven years old and these two grow bags growing this year's garlic are still going strong. Know what else is still going strong? Garden quickies. But that's all thanks to you guys. I hope to see you in the next one.
Plants truly are amazing. Colorful foliage reaching skywards to capture the sun's rays, while below the soil, white roots anchor them while simultaneously providing nutrients and water. As gardeners, it's where these two worlds of a plant's physiology intersect that really interest us. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we make plants fascinating. And today's episode is all about root collars. Just what is the root collar? We hear about it so much. We hear about it whenever we're planting or maintaining our crops. Well, like we mentioned, it's the exact point on a plant where the stem meets the roots. And it's almost always right around the soil line, separating the plant into the two halves of its anatomy. One of the clearest examples of root colors you'll find is on green onions. Even trees have root colors. Okay, so why are they important? Why are gardeners so concerned with this part of the plant, especially on a crop like strawberries? Well, it's because for a lot of our crops, the root color signifies how deep we can plant. Crops like strawberries need to keep the root colors above the soil line or the plant's gonna suffer. And in some cases, it could die. So identifying the location of that root color, it's imperative for proper planting depth. And how about those carrots? Showing off their root colors like it's the weekend. Some plants, however, and you tomato growers will know this, can actually move the root colors up and down the stems. They do this by sprouting adventitious roots and shoots all along the stem, thus establishing new root color locations automatically. Amazing stuff. The part that I find really amazing though is how the plants sprout and form the root color location immediately. And then away they go, just like clockwork. And just like clockwork, I hope to see you guys again in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.